that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 482nd edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. That is fresh today. <laughs> we went through this last time. Tom is in the flesh, he's just not in the studio. Right Tom? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully this is not going to be a, hopefully we're going to have a different way to do things soon, but this is where we are for the time being. Um, every day I get n information from the internet about energy and climate, climate change, things that have happened in the news in the previous 24 hours, and I put those things up um, at my blog, geoharvey.com. If you go down, um, Scroll down on the screen, uh, wh whether you're on a computer or whatever. I guess I, almost everybody's probably watching this on some kind of computer. You can scroll down, you can find a file and a website where you can look at the, uh, the thing that Tom and I do use to, to set up the show. You can also go to geoharvey.com and uh, find the stuff. That way you can actually read the articles that we're talking about. Well, I generally read the summary that uh, George gives me, and then I look at the uh, source, be it CNN or whatever, and I, read, I, I pull that up and read that, and generally make comments based upon what they say in the link. And sometimes these links are very worthwhile looking at themselves, they're very in-depth and comprehensive. Some of them are garbage, but I mean, some of them are very good. Yeah. So I'll try to mention that, and uh, we can go from here. We got one coming up right now from CNN. Yes. And it's, uh, it starts off with a good two and a half minute video and a lot of pictures, if you like a lot of pictures. Yes, and this is a... Uh, I'll, I'll start saying what it says. So okay. It the amount of Greenland ice that melted last weekend could cover West Virginia in a foot of water. There's a nice picture there of Greenland being covered. Well, not being covered, really. That used to, that should be all ice, and instead there's rivers flowing through it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, as Tom said, this is from CNN. Temperatures in northern Greenland, this is northern Greenland, could have been running it around be, 60. It should be the coldest part of Greenland. Yeah, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal for this time of year. Several days of unusually warm weather have triggered rapid melting. Rivers of meltwater are rushing into the ocean. And the, the picture that we have in front of us here is really kind of stayed compared to the stuff in the... Um, in the uh, video that Tom talked about. Well, ice, ice melting that's floating doesn't change sea levels, just like uh, ice cube in a cocktail. Yeah. But, but uh, ice melt from, that's already on land, like it, it is in much of Greenland, has the tendency of increasing the height of the ocean, which is kind of disastrous. Right, and this has been going on for years. The Greenland ice sheet has been melting in in uh, faster than it should for years. It should be melting faster than it should. Well, a normal melt <coughs> is uh, well. This this melt this melt the normal melt this year is not normal. Yes. Six million tons of water per <laughs> day, which is enough to fill. 7.2 million swimming pools. And I only have one swimming pool. <laughs> I call it a bathtub. <laughs> ah, okay. I was going to say I didn't, I'd never heard about that one before. <laughs> well, a record melting occurred in 2019. Yeah. An unexpectedly hot spring in a July heat wave 
cause the almost the entire ice sheet surface to melt. We've talked about that on the show. Right, we did. Global sea level rose permanently by one and a half millimeters as a result, mm. which doesn't sound like much, but uh, it's it's <laughs> it's not good. No, it's Greenland not. Greenland holds enough ice if it all melts to lift sea level by seven and a half meters around the world, which is twenty-four feet. Yeah. And what happens when what happens to various cities when the when the uh, water is up by twenty four feet? I got news for you, the they don't the, exist anymore. Yeah, the uh, Miami Beach is, is in jeopardy right yes. now. Yes, that's right. Okay, we should move on, Tom. Twenty twenty, scientists found that Greenland's ice sheet had melted beyond the point of no return. Yes. No efforts to stave off global warming can stop it from eventually disintegrating. Yeah. Okay. Our next piece is um, from Clean Technica. Yeah, we got a picture of a house there with a, a solar roof. With a solar roof. Hey, look at it. Hey, huh? With a solar roof. I'm just repeating what you said. Yeah, right. I'm looking at this and I say, why don't we see more of these? These make an awful lot of sense. Yes, they do. If you got an appropriately facing roof. It doesn't make sense not to put this stuff on. <laughs> yes. Okay, you got a title for this article? I can find one. Okay. GAF building second oh GAF is building the second solar shingle factory in Texas. The GAF stands for General Allen and Film, which doesn't mean anything at all, except that it's the name of a company that makes shingles. Yes. And they it's, make regular shingles and they make shingles. They're now starting to get into uh, solar shingles, which look the same, and they're easy to put up. Yeah. Okay, after GF Energy spent a billion dollars to build a solar uh, shingle factory, uh, some people wondered if they would, uh, if people would actually use them. But enough for selling for GAF to build a second factory in Georgetown, Texas, to manufacture its timber line solar roof products. A timber line is just a trademark, but uh, That's right. basically solar shingles look very much like ordinary roofing shingles. Well, these we things... Can start using the same techniques they've been using for years. Yeah. These are... GFC, these solar shingles are nailed to the roof substrate just like ordinary asphalt shingles. Right. Um, and that means that a that, that simplifies the the business of installing a a uh, solar roof. Now this is a different Greatly. system than really it, simplifies it. Yeah, this is a different system than Tesla has because Tesla is manufacturing solar it a shingles. Framework. Huh? Tesla requires a framework. Yes, but it, they're manufacturing. to the roof. They're manufacturing solar shingles that look. Almost exactly like, for example, slate. And um, this is this is a, a little different. Okay, should we go on, or do you have more? The final sentence from the article is significant. The shingles should pay for themselves in a few years, depending upon the retail cost of electricity in the area. Right. Yeah. And oh. The, 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 and the question comes up: Why doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, the next piece that we've got is from PR Newswire, which is a, a public relations system. But the um, the picture we've got is, is wind power and storage from from NL Green pretty Power. Pretty significant storage system, let me tell you. What's that? It's a pretty significant storage. This system. is significant, yeah. <coughs> Yes, and L Green Power said it has completed the Azure uh, Sky Wind Plus storage, which is uh, its first large hybrid wind project. So instead of you know we've we've talked about solar and storage primarily in the past. This is wind plus storage. It added battery storage at 
on, at other renewable project sites also, helping to ensure... Existing en projects, they just added, added uh, storage to them. Yes, helping ensure energy availability for Texans in high demand periods. <coughs> Whereas so, Azure Sky includes a 350 megawatt wind facility paired with 200 megawatt hours of storage. I guess that's what we're looking at in the picture. Yes. Yeah. Okay, our next item is from the BBC. We are up to um, Friday, July 22nd, and we have a picture of a wildfire near Athens in Greece last year. <coughs> They've got, pro Greece has had a number of very serious fires. Yeah. Well, this is from the BBC, and there's a lot of pictures in it. Yes. Like pictures. Is Europe set for its worst wildfire season? So far this year, the amount of land burned by fires across the European Union is more than three times greater than what you would expect by the middle of July. In some places, fires are becoming more expected, such as across the Mediterranean, and they are seeing better safeguards and awareness campaigns. So the governments are already re reacting, uh, responding to this change in demand. Oh, this is significant. The article says almost 1,400 square miles of land have been recorded as burnt. That's about the size of northern New England. Yeah. That's, this is serious. Yeah, that's Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. That's 1,400 square miles. Wow. France and Spain have recorded about seven times more land burnt up to the middle of July. UK has seen over four times more. Yeah. This is unusual. Unreasonably hot weather and low rainfall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We should probably go on. Yeah, we go. Monarch butterflies. I just love monarch butterflies. You know, I used to, it used to be that at certain times of year I could walk home from school and on the way I'd go buy milkweed plants and I could always find um, caterpillars of monarch butterflies on those plants. Well, that's where they live. Yeah, and I haven't seen a caterpillar for a monarch butterfly in years. I ha they used to be a lot more common around here than they are now. Yeah, well, w that's what the article is about. This is from CNN. What do you have for a title? Monarch butterflies could become extinct if we don't take these three steps. And they mention what they are. Yeah, one of the most popular insects is at risk of extinction, says a global organization focused on conservation and sustainability. The International Union for Conservation of Nature added the migratory monarch butterfly to its red list of threatened species as endangered. Now... Well, one of the biggest problems is the caterpillars. Yeah. They feed exclusively on the leaves of milkweed, but droughts have limited the growth of milkweed. Yes. And, and another thing that's hurting them is the use of glyphosate oh, on man. herbicide. Yeah. Now, there's, there's two things I'd like to mention to people uh, who are watching this, one of which is Brattleboro has been invaded by a species of plant called the dog strangling vine, which has nothing to do with strangling dogs. It's just called that. And it doesn't look like milkweed, but it is related to milkweed. And the monarch butterflies lay their eggs on the, on the leaves of the dog strangling vine. And when the eggs hatch, the, the Caterpillars uh, cannot feed on that because it's the wrong kind of plant. It's, there's a problem in timing, isn't it? No, it's it's more than timing. It's the the you could the, have the, 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 these plants grow before the the bugs are there. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that the monarch butterflies, the butterflies themselves identify these plants, which are closely related to milkweed as milkweed and they lay their eggs on them. Then the caterpillars can't survive on them. Um, and okay. anybody who wants to see monarch butterflies survive should take a look in um, uh, Wikipedia or something like that to, to, so that they can identify this particular plant. It's a, 
It's a plant that has distinctively shaped leaves. It is a climbing, viney plant that wraps around things the same way that um, bittersweet does. But it's a, it, and it is a, it's a perennial plant and it spreads and it has tiny purple flowers and we don't want it. It's not supposed to be here. And, and the larvae of the monarch butterflies do die as a result of it being there. Another thing that I'd like to mention is that the extinction that we're worried about here is not an extinction of all monarch butterflies because the monarch butterflies have, have subspecies or subgroups and the one that, is, is, uh, that they're worrying about is not um, uh, as all members of, of all species, of these species of monarch butterfly, it is the ones that migrate. There's, there are migrate, migratory populations of monarch butterflies, and there are... Very significant migrations. They go from the northeast of the United States to Mexico. That's right. Every but, year. But there are groups in the south in, in that that don't migrate and they are not in danger the ones that are in danger are the ones that come to vermont and and you know other northern areas and used to be just so common it was it was it was really amazing but you know i i have seen a couple of monarch butterflies this year I suppose we should probably move on, don't, shouldn't we, Tom? Can't do it. Okay. Um, this is a picture of a delivery truck. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is from Clean Technica. The USPS says that up to 40% of new delivery vehicles will be electric. Under it's pressure. It's going to be close to 50. Yeah. Under pressure from the Biden administration, several states and the UAW, uh, the United States Postal Service this week announced that at least 50 percent. Now, I have to say, the title says 40. This says 50. I don't know what is correct. I tried looking. It looks to me like the 50 is. Well, it, it, was, to, it was expected for, to be 40, but because the, the old ones are getting, are getting really, really costly, it's up to 50. The 50's valid. Okay. Well, the Postal Service said only 10% of this new delivery vehicle would right. be battery electric. That's right. That's right. Some of the vehicles in use today are 30 years old and require constant maintenance to keep running. That's right. So they're, they're faced with a, with a problem and they're solving it. They're going to buy more of these things. Yes. Um, but in total, the U.S. Postal Service No, it's not. This is, and this really is important. Um, so. What it means basically is they are converting to electric. It's yeah. It's going to take a little while, but they're, it, at the end of this, it's going to be all electric. Or virtually all. We can hope. Okay, we're up to Saturday. It just makes sense. What's that? Huh? It just makes sense. It's oh, like absolutely. It makes economic it does. sense. Yeah. We're up to Saturday, July 23rd, and we have. Um, a, a picture of some cooling towers. A picture of cooling towers. There it is. And this is... Wait a minute, I want to point out that that's not pollution. That is, that is, um, uh, that's basically what steam. It's water vapor that has steam. condensed. Yeah. And this is from Ars Technica. Nuclear power plants are struggling to stay cool. <laughs> this is significant. This is significant. In this heat wave, it's no longer possible to use river water. Um, and that picture looks to me like it was taken from the dry bed of a river. Um, it, it is no longer possible to use river water to cool reactors without killing aquatic life. A few weeks ago... In some cases, the rivers aren't even there anymore. Yeah. EDF began powering down some reactors... Heat-related cuts, malfunctions, and maintenance have reduced the nuclear out power output in France by nearly 50 percent. Now, so they have to derate these things because there's not enough water to stay cool. They have to cut them, cut them back. 
Yeah, if you think about it, Vermont Yankee um, produced uh, 600 and some odd uh, megawatts of power, but if you looked at that plant and you know looked at the specifications, you'd see that really only about 35 percent of the energy generated by the the nuclear uh, uh, fission was actually was actually converted into electricity. The rest of it was heat, and that heat had to be got rid of somehow. So they they used uh, water in the in the uh, river, and they used cooling towers, and um, you know there was enough heat coming out of that pl plant to heat every house in Vermont, but it was it was just put into the air and the water, and um, yeah, it's not a it's not a it's not. N nuclear plants are not terribly efficient, N and neither are coal um, or natural gas baseload power plants. None of these plants can get much above 35% efficiency. It's the nature of, of the plant. It's, it's kind of a built-in thing. Well, you, you got to ask why are we still building them? Well, we're not really, <laughs> but uh, building, well, building nuclear could be too expensive. Yeah, although there's a lot of people pushing for what are called small modular reactors. Okay. Well, you know, that's speculative right now because they don't exist yet. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we are up to um, a, new, a new time here. Let's see what we've got. This is from Renewable well, Energy Magazine. This one that's coming up is quite interesting. Yes, it is. This is Renewable Energy Interview. <laughs> Reduce the need for electricity storage. Yeah, solar, uh, uh, solar panels are usually installed facing south at an angle. In a new study, a research team from HTWK Leipzig shows it, it would make sense to, uh, in the future to primarily install bifacial sol solar modules vertically and to use agricultural land for this. Um, and, yeah, here we're seeing exactly what they're talking about, and it's very clear. You know, a, a tractor could could drive up and down this field um, very easily. Very easily, it's it's kind of they could grow they could grow cor even corn there if they wanted. They could, except you know they don't. I'm sure they wouldn't want to plow this land uh, along these lines because the water in the, in the in the uh, troughs would just run down the hillside. But um, that that has to do with this particular piece of land. Nevertheless, I yeah, you. HWK Leipzig means the U Leipzig University of Applied Sciences. Right. So it's a college. Yes, that's right. Okay, you have more and on that. Artificial solar modules are more expensive than conventional solar but they increase the number of hours of available solar power. Yes, and it also they start uh, cr uh, producing electricity strongly earlier in the day, earlier in the day and they, they produce it l uh, later in the day. The one time that and they... Later in the day. Yeah, the one time that they don't do well is around noon, which is when conventional solar panels do well. Okay. So it's a different approach to solar panels, and uh, you know, it wouldn't have occurred to me to do it this way, but uh, it looks like it uh, makes sense. Yeah, another thing about these bifacial solar panels is that you can have them um, aligned east and west in areas where there's a lot of snow, and they will pick up um, sunlight from the snow that is behind them. So... No, it didn't, but I've, I've seen this in the past. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture of a ship. With a sail. With a sail, a very unusual sail. It's kind of interesting because for years and years and years, shipping around the world was taken care of quite well by winds. Oh, yeah. Well, that's We're the only way they did it. The Gulf is making all those guys eat. They sold them all over the place using nothing but wind. Yeah. They would occasionally get stuck in the doldrums, though. <laughs> yeah. 
the doldrums for anybody who doesn't know is 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 a meteorological area where the wind is not terribly reliable. Okay, what do you have for title here? Wind power returning to open seas now with artificial intelligence. Yeah, 20% savings in fuel efficiency for a two-day retrofit is noteworthy. This is what they're saying here is that a two-day long retrofit will produce a 20% savings in fuel efficiency for a ship, and that's ongoing. It explains it why. Looks like it, it, it makes sense economically. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it explains why Kawasaki Kissin Kaisha Limited, a leading shipping company, is adding more wind power to its roster of cargo ships. The K line, as it's called, also expects to leverage artificial intelligence for greater improvements. You got more well, on that? They just threw another three of these sea wing sails that you see in the picture, so uh, something's, uh, they're doing something right. Yes, I think so. All right, um, should I move on? This Kawasaki Kishin Kaisha is called K Line. Yes. You might see, see their ships, they got a big K on the side of them. Oh, yeah, okay. Our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture here of. Cyanobacteria in a in a uh, um, a culture. In a flask. Yeah, in a flask. What do you have for a title? Bacteria could help capture greenhouse gases. In Interesting. A What's that? Interesting. Yeah, in a paper published in uh, Nature Chemical Biology. King and others from Simon, Simon Fraser University, that's Professor King, examined uh, the important role carbon dioxide plays in cyanobacteria, photosynthetic organisms found in water. Cyanobacteria use carbon to create essential nutrients that sustain their life cycle. Now, obviously, that's, these cyanobacteria are capturing carbon dioxide and can bring it uh, down very quickly. Well, basically, that's the story here. Uh, there's a couple of things that I'd like to I'd like to say. One of which is, if you think about cyanobacteria, it's it's a the kind of green scummy stuff that that occasionally gets into Lake Champlain and kills fish, because it can that's be true. can that's be poisonous. True. In, in Lake Champlain. On the other hand, another species of cyanobacteria is called spirulina, and that is added to food products because of its um, its uh, because it's good for you to eat it. <coughs> okay. Okay. Should we go on, Tom? Uh, I guess we might as well. Can't dance. Okay. A nice picture of some uh, solar, of a solar facility. That's right, we do. It's 50 megawatts, and uh, for what it's worth, we have 5 megawatts right here in Brattleboro. Right. This is from the Al Albuquerque Journal. PNM, which is the name of a company, well, it's a public service company of New Mexico. Right. Inundated with companies seeking clean energy. Yeah, public, the Public Service Company of New Mexico announced that it commissioned a 50-megawatt solar facility to provide clean energy to a Facebook data center in Las Lunas. <coughs> Excuse me. PNM is supplying... That's a good size data center. PNM is supplying nearly 400 megawatts of clean power to Facebook, but other companies are expected to follow the lead of Facebook in this. <coughs> you got more on that, Tom? Well, it makes sense. I mean, uh, they use a lot of energy and why pay for the fuel? Yes. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? I think we can. Now, this is I an interesting picture. Well, I'm looking at my notes and I, and, and I haven't read a lot of these notes yet. I usually usually do, but my computer was down yesterday, so I couldn't do it. Yeah, by the way, I'm going to be stopping on my way home from the studio and, and dropping off a computer for you. I've got it with me. 
Well, I ain't going anywhere, so I'll well, we'll be waiting for you. Okay. Um, our next item well, is from... a picture of an uh, extremely large telescope, and that is large. This thing is unbelievable it's so big. It's ten times the size. Well, you can't really tell from that picture, but uh, a human being in that picture would just be swallowed right up. There's a, this is big. Yeah, th this thing is ten times as big as any tele telescope that exists on Earth today. Um, this uh, uh, is from Clean Technica, and I'm going to comment on those on those orange things in a moment. But what do you have for title, Tom? Solar Park powering astronomical Obser observatory in Chile's Atacama Desert. A solar plant with a capacity of nine megawatts has now been completed at the European South um, Southern Observatory's uh, Paranal Observa Ob Observatory in Chile. The, uh, the PV installation is also intended to power the world's largest telescope, which is currently un under construction at the site. And I want to explain that orange thing. This is an artist's rendering. It is not a photograph or anything like that. And I mean, you can't see those orange things if you're standing there. Well, you can't even see this thing yet, can you? No, not yet. If this were in, op in operation, um, I don't think you should be able to see those things at all. Um, I don't think so. They are, they, they are uh, <laughs> laser... Right. Yeah, they are laser beams that are... That are aimed at a spot in the sky to produce an artificial, a, sort, a, a kind of a weird artificial star-like thing that the, um, that the telescope can use to focus. This telescope has got a... Yeah. And so that's what it's all about. There's a total of eight of them. And uh, in this, they're, they're put together in pairs. I don't know if that's what they're actually going to do, but... Uh, that's why those things are there, and you should not be able to see them. Or, or they if they're putting, putting a bunch of these things around the world, don't they? I don't know. Uh, that's what I think I got out of this article. Okay. Um, let's see. Our, we're up to Monday. This is interesting. Uh, will be ultimately the world's largest optical telescope with a main mirror diameter of 39 meters. 39 meters is gigantic. It's, it's pretty big, baby. I mean, the, my car. The, the Mount Palomar uh, Observatory that, that opened up when we were kids uh, is a That's two... About two meters. It, it, it's 200 inches, which is five meters. And this thing is five how... Meter. What's that? This thing is 39 meters. It's unbelievable it's so big. I mean, you could build the Mount Palomar Observatory inside the dome of this thing. Yeah, very easily. Okay, we're up to Monday, July 25th, and we have a picture here of, of battery cells. This is not what I would call... battery cells. What's that? There's a bunch of little battery cells. It's not what I would call an, an exciting picture. <laughs> Yes. Like a thousand of them. Um, this is from Clean Technica. S. Rose Energy, the company, raises a solid state battery with 400 watt hours per kilowatt energy density for production. Yeah. That doesn't mean, mean much to me. N no. <laughs> I can't I, relate to 400 yeah, watt I, hours I, per kilowatt. I know what you mean. But it's got to be a lot. CNEV Post reports that Esfolt Energy is the first company to create a prototype 20 amp hour solid state battery cell with an energy density of 350 to 400 watt hours per kilogram. The cells should enable EVs to drive a thousand kilometers, which is 600 and some odd miles, or more on a single charge, according to the company. Now, this is the thing that's important. First of all, these are solid state, um, these are solid state. I have, my, I have trouble wrapping my head around this. Uh, 
wrapping my head around a solid Yeah, how pattern. do you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but you know, if you think about it, Tom, if you had a piece of plastic and you, and you shuffled your feet on that, on that thick carpet, uh, you could use that piece of plastic to hold the electric charge. And that's, that's, you know, there's no, there's no chemical changes in that. It's just an accumulation of charge. Um, but these things are, uh, on the, in, the, in the 300 to 400 watt hour per, uh, per kilogram, these things are far, they store for, far more energy in the same amount of weight as lithium ion batteries. So again, we're what well, we're talking about. You don't have to worry about the weight of the electrolyte. It ain't there. That's true. That's true. Okay, we should probably go on to our next story. Yeah, this is the battery of the future, really. It's, it's a possibility. I don't know where this is all going to go. I, every time I turn around, I... Their batteries are going to... They're going to pay it a, 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 a part, but a different part. Yes. Okay, the next item that we've got comes from a, an organization called the Energy Mix. And that is a Halliburton fracking site that we're looking at. No wonder it's such a mess. <laughs> they're, they're fracking right, right now, and they need all that equipment. Yeah. They call it a Halliburton frack job. Frack job, yeah. Well, what do you got for a title? Global gas expansion endangers climate targets. Rebuffing the still widespread narrative that natural gas is a, quote, bridge, end quote, fuel, a team of German energy economists is warm warning that the massive global expansion of gas infrastructure now underway puts both climate mitigation efforts and a transition to renewable energy at risk. That's interesting. Yeah, I saw in the news today that um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is actually leasing out, they're, they're putting out, um, auctioning off areas of that huge uh, peat area that they've got, which happens to be a site for the gorillas that are endangered, so that people can go in there and drill for oil. Yeah, well, we're going to be I mean, talking. What do we need more? Gorillas or oil? I don't know. You know, we, we don't need all this stuff. Okay. Somebody needs it. Somebody wants it. The, re that the reason for that need is the letter S with a couple of lines through it. Yes. Okay, our next item is from the BBC. And uh, we have a picture of a firefighting airplane. And um, what do you have for a title? Well, it's one of the ways that you can extinguish forest fires is with dumping uh, fire fiery prevention materials on Yes, that's, that's what right. That's right there. Yeah. Just lost an airplane doing that, by the way. Yeah. Okay, what do you have for a title? Oak Fire. That's the name of it. Wildfire grows as firefighters battle punishing heat. The Oak Fire has now burned 15,603 acres. Now, today it's a little over 18,000. Yeah, today it's a little over 18,000. This, uh, this was last Monday. Um, and is still 0% contained. Today it's about 30% contained. California Fire Department said on Sunday night, more than 6,000 people have been evacuated, the number is much higher, and 10 structures destroyed, that number has climbed to something like 50. A further 3,271 structures, homes, and businesses are under threat. This is a big fire. These people's home. I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah, I'm, imagine coming home from work and finding your house is burnt down. It, it, that kind of thing has happened, and people are saying, that they, you know, that they've lost their most valuable possessions. Fortunately, the the things that, you know, their family is still alive, but in terms of physical possessions, things are just gone. 
And this, of course, is happening during, during this period of drought and high heat. And, you know, this, this fire started up on Friday. And as of uh, our Monday report, it had already gone to 15,000 acres. Well, if you want to uh, pull this one up, there's a uh, video of uh, thousands of uh, people uh, evacuating the wildfires in California. Okay. We're up to Tuesday, July 26th, and we have an item from CNN. Um, and that just happens to be Gaborone, the capital of Botswana. <laughs> yeah. It comes from CNN. Yes. Searching for more oil as the world heats up. The world needs to cut down on oil production, but it's going in the wrong direction. Nambia, Botswana, and Congo want to get the same benefits from their land that Western countries used to, used to become wealthy. But their need is to address poverty. And what that says is they're not trying to get wealthy, they're just trying to feed people. Our priority is not to save the planet, one official said. It makes me think that I should, I should make buttons, big buttons that people can wear on their shirts saying, save the planet, question mark. What's in it for me? Question mark. Good, good point. <laughs> well, CNN has written about this before. Yeah. And they say the most inconvenient truth of Joe Biden's presidency is that his short-term political fortunes rely on gas prices getting lower. But the long-term fortunes of the country and the planet rely on people using less carbon-emitting energy. Right. Okay, should we go so on? He's looking also at the dollar sign. Yeah, absolutely. Should we go on, Tom? I think we can. I mean, the article goes on about looking for more oil in Africa. Yeah. But uh, that's kind of dull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Our next item here is from Clean Technica. Well, this is interesting. It's a picture of some easy charging. Yes. And a guy named Ed Harvey wrote, uh, is responsible for this picture. Probably not related to me. it's an interesting uh, story article because there's a lot of grass. If you like grass. <laughs> Somebody should bring in well, a goat. You have to be charged that if they put up these charging stations all over the place, which is inevitable, by the way. Yes. You know, it's going to change things. Why pay, for the, uh, why pay for the gas when you get the sun for free? That's right. Uh, what do you have for a title for the article, Tom? Bloomberg declares that the tipping point has been reached. What yes. do you mean by that? Well, a report by Bloomberg NEF declares that the tipping point for battery EV ascendancy has been reached globally. Although acceptance of EVs <coughs> varies from country to country, a pattern has emerged. Quote, once 5% of new car sales go fully electric, Everything changes, end quote. And they have, globally. Well, it's inevitable. Yeah. Unfortunately, it everybody... Well, but it's inevitable. Yeah. Unfortunately, everybody seems to be ahead of the United States on this. We've well, got... Well, yeah, I looked at that letter asked with Weinstruid. Yeah, we've got people who are trying to keep us back specifically so they can make money. That's what it looks like. Well, there's still, there's still money in selling oil and gas, you know. That's so, right. And the people who own the oil and gas want to sell it all. Yes. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture here of a city. I would bet that most Americans don't even know this city exists. I just wanted to say something about the last one. Oh, okay, just go ahead. I'm sorry, Tom. So the electrical vehicle will be normal. Some have even compared driving an internal combustion engine to smoking. Yeah. It, just, it, it will not be just un, unusual. It will be antisocial and detrimental to your health. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, our next the item. of the city of Gold Coast. That's what Where it is. is that? Well, I, I was saying, you know, I would bet that most Americans don't even realize that this city exists. 
but it's an important city in Queensland, Australia. Okay, okay, it's a big city. Look at those buildings. Yeah, well, they're you know, they're they're to taller. Australia than, can do stuff like that too. They they even got a skyscraper seven stories tall. <laughs> that is a that is from uh, Oklahoma. There's in a song about Kansas City. Everything's up and up to date in Kansas City. Um, that picture is that picture is not from Australia. It's from Oklahoma. No, no, no. I said that the that the <laughs> line that they even got a skyscraper seven stories tall or seven stories high oh, okay. is <laughs> is from a song in the in the musical Oklahoma. Yeah, there's a lot of skyscrapers up there. To date in Kansas City. What's that? Everything's up to date. In Kansas That's City. right. You got it. Well, this happens to be Gold Coast. So, what do you have for a title? The Queensland government is electrifying. Yes. To speed up the pro process of electrifying their vehicles on the road in Australia's Sunshine State, which is Queensland. The Queensland government is proposing to transition its fleet of electric uh, to electric over the next four years. That means 100% of eligible Queensland government fleet passenger vehicles should be zero emission by 2026. Okay. <laughs> It's just happening faster in Queensland. Well, yeah, the, the Queensland, what they want to do is they want to build out charging infrastructure, and they figure that if they've got their own vehicles all electric, that's going to happen faster. Well, it is inevitable. I mean, pretty soon charging stations are going to be as common as gas stations are today. More common, I would think, because they can be Not put common, all, really. all over the place. They can be put in front of the local library. They can be... You know, and and there are other things about these charging st gas stations. I've always thought of as really um, uh, dangerous because because they're places where you 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 have the possibility of having serious fires. What's well, interesting? I live in the high rise in downtown Brattleboro, a part house. Yeah. And they're already talking about uh, thinking about putting up chargers in the parking lot. Good for them. Okay. I mean, it's going to be a while before we see them, but they're talking about it already. Yep. Okay, we have an item from CNN, and I didn't, I didn't like their photographs for, they couldn't be used for, for uh, tr um, various reasons having to do with, with, um, uh, Oh, what do you call it? Not trade. Copyright. Copyright. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, so I went and found I this. I picture of this one. I didn't, I, I, I didn't get a copy of it because my computer was down. Well, this picture is a pyrocumulus cloud. And this is actually... Uh, okay. This is actually... That's what that is. Yeah. This is actually the oak fire producing the cloud. It was taken only the day before. Um, so the fire is producing the cloud. The oak fire, which is the subject of this article, is actually producing that cloud, yeah. Wow. So what do you have for a title? I don't have a title. Oh, you don't? <laughs> I didn't get this one. Okay, California's oak fire destroys at least 42 structures as it burns through more than 18,000 acres. California's Oak Fire has burned through over 18,000 acres and destroyed more than 40 structures since it started near Yosemite National Park on Friday. It is now 26% contained, according to an update from CAL FIRE, the State Fire Management Agency. Now, this, this article came out, uh, let's see, yesterday. And, of course, I've already read the stuff from today. So it has continued to grow, but at a pace that is very, very much slower than it originally did. Tom, I take well, you it... You can't actually say that the warm weather causes the, uh, the fires to happen, but it certainly provides a uh, good place for it to grow. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and I mean, the fires are caused by things like lightning, but once that happens, look out. Yes. I take it that you don't have either of the next two articles either. Is that correct, Tom? I don't have anything from Wednesday, July 27th. Okay, let me, let me go through these then. Um, the, as we've talked about the Oak Fire, the next item is from uh, Re News. The title is Manor uh, Renewable, which is the name of a company, is to power Dogger Bank construction. And what this says is SSE Renewals, Renewables and Equinor awarded Manor Renewables Energy a contract to provide temporary power for the construction of the 3600 megawatt Dogger Bank offshore wind project. Now, I got to point out 3600 megawatts. 3.6 gigawatts. And what's a gigawatt, Tom? Can you explain that? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> Dogger Bank will have 277 GE Holiade X 13 megawatt and 14 megawatt turbines, and it will be the world's biggest offshore wind farm. And this article... Yeah, now those are big turbines. Those are the biggest turbines you can buy today. Yes. And this article is about Manor Renewable Energy getting a contract to supply power for building this wind farm so they can they can have temporary power at sea. So the article's not about the wind farm, it's about the company that's producing power for it. Yes, that's right. Although you can learn a lot about the wind this farm. This wind farm is going to be huge. This is huge. This is at Dogger Bank. And by the way, if you were to... Where is Dogger Bank? Well, Dogger Bank is... I think Is that the North sea? it's in the North Sea, and I think the nearest point to England is about a hundred miles off off the coast. So you could you could get in a boat and spend hours going in the direction of Dogger Bank, and if these wind turbines were up, you wouldn't see anything until you had been going for for a long time. You'd probably get pretty bored before the first one appeared. This is way out to sea. But 3,600 3, megawatts is a lot of electricity. That's for sure. Yeah. And the final, ob the final article of the day, and we have a picture of transmission lines for this, um, this final article comes from Utility Products. And Tom, you're going to have things to say about this one too. I know you didn't read it, but it, it, when I read this, um, the synopsis, you'll be surprised. MISO, which is the, midi, uh, the middle, Midwest uh, Independent System Operator, approves 18 transmission projects in the U.S. Midwest integrating more renewable energy. Now, that's the title. Um, the synopsis reads... The system is going to be putting up these uh, generating stations of, of one sort or another. they got to connect them to the grid. Exactly. The board of MISO, the Midwest Power Grid Operator, voted unanimously to, in, to approve a tranche of renewable of transmission projects representing investments of $10.4 billion. The projects will integrate about 53 gigawatts and create more than 200,000 jobs. You got any comments on that, Tom? <laughs> well, as I keep saying, can you watch this bigger one? And this is 53 of them. No, and, and the, the nature, the entire nature of the grid is changing as we speak. Yeah. I mean, instead of it, it being one big generating station at Niagara Falls, say, as it used to be, we're, we're getting distributed generation throughout the grid. And they got to connect all of these together. Yes. And this is... This is That's why they clear up the grid. I, I was blown away when I read these numbers because this is, this is just... Uh, they're, the, the, the 18... This is the future. 200,000 jobs are being created. 200,000 jobs. It sounds like... 
you know, it's, it would, it would, um, it means a lot of people are going to have jobs. 53 gigawatts, that's unbelievable. And this is, um, this is uh, projects which are going to include wind projects and it's going to include solar projects. They may include something else, I don't know. But it's going to be renewable energy, so this is, it's going to be primarily wind and solar. But even so, it's going to be the equivalent of at least, I'm going to say probably 20 new nuclear power plants. And no, nuclear plants don't make sense anymore economically. No, they don't. I don't think that's a new one in the last 10 years. Well, we've got two reactors under right. construction, and every time I turn around, yeah, I see... they've been under construction for 10 years. Yeah, and every time I turn around, the price that, uh, that the people are going to have to pay for those nuclear reactors goes up. It's way over double what was originally envisioned. Yep, absolutely. And so, you know... What can you say about that? I don't know. Anyway, that is our. Well, the future is uh, you're not going to have to. You're not going to be paying for the fuel. You think so? I think so. It's I think some politician is going to. For nothing and the sun shining free. Yeah, you're some politician is going to figure out some way to to uh, to have people pay. And, <laughs> Stupid. Yes. Was that Bill or was it Hillary? I think it was Hillary. Why is it Hillary? Okay, we're at the end of the show. I am going to wave goodbye. Tom is going to wave goodbye from home. I'm going to wave goodbye on my little pet here. You're what? And nobody's going to see it. <laughs> I'm going to wave goodbye on my little pet here and nobody's even going to see it. That's right, but I'm going to wave goodbye and that's what we're doing. And people will see it. Yes, that's right. I'm waving for me. Tom is at home. I guarantee you. I'm okay. I guarantee that Tom is waving from home, and we are wishing that everybody have a terrifically untroubled week. <laughs>